This episode of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast, was made possible by Global Blood Therapeutics and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. Visit gbt.com to learn more. Warriors, I am uh, humbled and honored today because the, the guest that we have literally requires no introduction. He is somebody who you are familiar with. It is, it is somebody who you are, you have seen over and over. His work is everywhere. His, his fingerprints are all over sickle cell disease. In fact, he even recently contributed to Lancet Hematology. He recently contributed to a new sickle cell textbook. I mean, this warrior is one of my biggest inspirations. I was lucky enough to have a conversation with Hertz Nazaire a year and a half ago. In that conversation, which he he let me record as I was preparing for my TED Talk, that is a conversation that, I mean, it's really powered me over the last 18 months. I draw inspiration from that conversation to this day. And I thought, how wonderful would it be to get Hertz on this platform to talk a little bit about his journey with sickle cell disease? We have Hertz Nazaire. Hertz, welcome to Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the work that you have been doing. You know, so it's an honor to be able to hang out. Yeah, we're we're that's exactly what we're doing, man. We're just hanging out today. We're just gonna we're just gonna talk and uh, you know dive into it a little bit, man. I um I gotta say the the first thing that has ever happened um, to me that was a Hertz Nazaire thing was my colleague gave me a clock that had 10 redefined on it. And I was like, where, where is this picture from? What, what happened here? And uh, that's, that's how I first saw your work. And of course, as my time went on, as I got more familiar with sickle cell disease, uh, your work is everywhere. I mean, 10 redefined and all of your various depictions of sickle cell disease are almost used. I, I'm comfortable saying in 90% of the sickle cell presentations that are given, I see your work. But Hertz, what I want to do is I want to, I, want, I want to spend time. I mean, people know about your current work. But I want to spend some time diving into who Hertz Nazaire is. You know, we all know you superficially, but who who are you, man? I mean, let's start with the story of where you were born. I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I grew up there for about about eight years or so, and then um, my mom my mom left when I was you know really really small. I didn't really know her, so she spent like seven years in the United States in New York. Then I came to join her. It was a, a, a struggle because I didn't really know who my mom was and I needed to find a way to communicate. I was really, really a shy kid. So the only way I could communicate was drawing her stuff. And that's how the art stuff got started because I used it as a means to communicate with my mom. That's when I, anything that I felt like it, it was my emotions or my feelings, that's how I communicated. So it ended up sickle cell being part of that later on, but that's how arts got started for me. But it's always been New York area, Connecticut. Part of the story is that I lost my mom when I was, um, before I turned 13 or so. I became a ward of the state. So uh, things kind of like um, went downhill from there, dealing with sickle cell and dealing with life and losing a parent. How old were you at that time, Hertz? Sometimes my mind doesn't do the math, right? Because it's like, I remember those times when I was younger, when my mom was still around, she was the one who was taking care of me. So I didn't really, it was before my, my 13th birthday. It was in August. But um, I remember those moments, my mom was told by doctors that I wasn't going to make it. And um, it was kind of like a shock that I lost. I'm the one who lost my mom instead of she's losing me. She was always worried about that. I remember one day that I, I stayed in my room. I was always in my room. Instead of drawing, I was like trying to count the years. I remember writing down 1988, 1989, 1990. You know, I, I kept count, ticking up these things until I turned 18 and I stopped because that's what the number was, you know, at the time they were telling you that, you know, you weren't, you're not going to survive this thing. And it's like, it was always in the back of my mind how deadly this disease was because that's what I was told. Death wasn't really serious 
until I saw my mom dying in front of me and I was, you know, in a car crash and it was, it became real, you know, and I survived, but it became something to fight, you know, to, to, to say, I'm not gonna allow this disease to take me out, you know, because I can see how fragile life was, you know, how you can lose a person that you care about so much. And I just kept fighting, you know. I mean, I'm I'm thankful that you did, man, because like I said, you're this is more than your your survival from sickle cell disease. You're you're actually inspiring a whole community of people. Um, so your presence is very much needed, and 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 I'm I'm really happy that you pushed on and you fought. And yeah, I mean, over the years, I've I've you know I've noticed how my my art impacted people in many ways, but it's just like. I just kind of try to remind people that I'm going through the same things they're going through. I get annoyed by the same things, you know, I get, I get kicked out of hospitals, you know, I go through the same kind of deals that they struggle with, you know, paying rent, you know, things like that. So it's just been a process of understanding that we all have gifts that we can give to back to this community. And we all have a certain amount of responsibility and accountability that we should carry as as patients when we are sick. Because sometimes even now, you know, when I'm not feeling very good mentally, like if I'm a little depressed or stressed, I might not make my next appointment because I know that I'm not centered, like mindful. I'm mindful that I'm not centered in a way that I know that I'm going to give these people some attitude. You know what I mean? And they don't deserve that. They're like real good people at UConn where I go. And it's like, I know that I, I, I can't give these folks this attitude because they saved my life so many times, you know? I've noticed that in our community that, you know, we are just human beings. And sometimes patients, they're not all advocates. They're just human beings. Sometimes they just allow, they're not trained to be centered or, you know, go through the process I've gone through because I've gone through the process because I realized that every time I go to the hospital, every time I go to this new place, I'm leaving behind a memory, a fragment of my behavior. They take that and run with it. So if I'm kind, I'm hoping they're going to be kind to the next warrior that comes behind me. But if I'm, you know, giving them a lot of trouble, I feel like, man, I'm going to cause a lot of trouble for the next warrior that comes behind me. And so I carry a lot of responsibility when I go there, but it shouldn't be only on, on the patients. You know, it should be on, on the people who are actually trained to deal with people in pain. Yeah, no, we, we talk about this a lot amongst ourselves too, that, you know, when people have a bad experience with a doctor, the doctor's having a bad day, they're being a jerk that day, or they're arrogant, or some of them are just not, not very nice that that leaves a memory too and that leaves a mark and that makes the next interaction with that patient that much harder or maybe that patient doesn't come in to see us so yeah it's difficult for me i i, I find that my relationship and the, how i follow up with a doctor if they're going to provide me with something new like i'm having trouble with my eye doctors recently it's just like i've had this new eye doctor i go to see him and he seemed like a cool guy everything about him seemed really cool and he's like yeah i've seen some sicklers and as soon as he said that word it's like oh my god man he doesn't know how much i struggled with that word it's like when i was in the bronx they used to call me that word so many times and i felt like getting off the gurney and wanting to fight because i hate that word you know in the south they accept that you know many of the warriors accept that word and people carry it around like a banner. And it's like, they don't know the kind of history I had, how painful that word felt to me. You told me that. You said that that's the biggest, you said that's the biggest slur somebody could say to you. Yeah, it is because it's not just the word being the word. It's just the, the way I've seen the faces of the people who use it, the memory of the bad times that I've had, the people that have used it, I've had some real bad times with those folks. And it's like, it, it carries that weight. Those are the type of things that causes you to have a, a negative relationship with somebody who's gonna provide you care. Like I have real eye troubles and I need to go back to the see that eye doctor. 
but I've been just like, ah, oh, let me just take care of my mental health. You know, I don't want to hear that word again. You know what I mean? Those, those type of things, little things like that make a big difference. But a lot of people don't know how impactful that can be. But if you're an advocate and you get on stage and you say that word, the people in the crowd are going to, oh, he said it, she said it, so it must be okay. You know, so I felt like for 20 years of fighting that word and to find out today I'm still fighting that word, it's kind of disheartening, you know what I mean? So sometimes you get to that point. So if it's like a time capsule, it's like looking back, I'm like, I started back then fighting that word and I'm still fighting that word now. And I'm hoping that we can get to a point that we can all understand each other and these kind of issues don't repeat as much. We're always fighting that, you know, not just the word stickler, but just the whole concept. Because I, I think what it is, is it's just putting everybody in a box, right? So it's not, it's not Mr. Nazaire in room 10 who's having pain today and we need to figure out what's going on. It's a uh, sickler with pain is in room 10. Like everybody's the same. It's all one big box that you can throw people in. And, and so, I, you know, the word is one thing, but the mindset is the problem. I don't know how we change the mindset. That's the problem I have with the word is because that if you had a negative encounter with a patient, then you just label that patient sicker. You just carry that word to the next one and the next one and the next one. And you don't really think about their temperament or their personality. You don't think of them as human beings. You just keep thinking of them as these patients because then they're not people and there's no differences. You know, I'm different from the next guy. You know, I'm not perfect, but I feel like I've earned to be a unique person. I've, I've done the work in myself to be a unique person, to express myself in a unique way. Everybody has some bad days, but we all can, can, can be kind, kind to each other. We all can be civil to each other. You know, we live in a country that's a, a political mess right now. But it's been like that for the sickle cell community for a long, long time. It's been a, a, a distrustful, torn apart kind of civil war going on between the people who are sick and the people who provide the care. It shouldn't be that way, you know? So I always felt like I'm, I'm always gonna try to be an advocate and I'm always gonna try to be on the side of the science where it sits and what the facts are. So I can just continue to be you know, a partner to those people who are trying to give us care because I know I've gone through some bad experiences, but I don't see the doctors as enemies, you know, because I see these are the folks that we need when we are sick. I think the point that you made hurts though about, you know, as someone with sickle cell disease, you feel like you leave a fragment of memory with your experience. I think that's true of doctors too, right? The responsibility is on us as well, because those experiences that we create, the negative ones, they stick with you. You're going to take that with you to the next appointment. Yeah, sometimes you, 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 you do that. And it's like, that's the thing that you have to be uh, mindful and aware that that's the case for you to be able to defeat that. Like I said, sometimes I can't go to my next appointment because I know I'm not centered. Being centered is meaning that I have to let go of some bad experiences. I have to let go of some certain things that I'm feeling, you know, that I need to let go of. You know, there's certain triggers. Like if there's like, I go to an appointment, but there's a new person there. I remember giving this kind new nurse such a hard time because she had to go through this process. She's nervous, she's new, and she's going through my chart. So she's asking me all these questions that the, the regular staff would not ask. But those are questions about my medical history and they bring up such gross memories of being in the ICU and going through some trauma. And it brings back this PTSD type, you know, uh, a feeling where you feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by this, this past, you know? So certain things can trigger a, a person to have a, a negative time. And we don't really address a lot of those those uh, anxieties and, and emotions enough sometimes because we just think people are just being mean or, or being negative because they're just negative people, but they're not. They've just gone through a lot of suffering and a lot of pain, and they're not able to 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 address it 
or, or at least even see it, you know? Some people don't even want to see that they're depressed. Some people don't really want to see that they're angry. You got to know you're angry before you can get better. I'm a very angry person. That's, but that's true of doctors too, man. I, I, you know, doctors are not always centered. You know, we, 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 we approach situations sometimes, we come into situations hot sometimes, right? And I think that that's a really good point. That's a learning point for all of us is that you really to center, center yourself. And if you're not centered, don't, don't, don't engage with the patient if you're not centered. That's a really good, that's a really good learning point. Yeah, I think one of the points that patients need to see on that side of it is that doctors have to see so many patients. They have to see so many of us. And if they, they have one patient they care about and they're human beings and they go through these experiences where these patients are sick, they're suffering, they might lose a patient here, but they cared about this patient and they, they had this uh, emotional attachment. So now they detach themselves because they felt hurt because they went through that experience. So some of those folks, man, after years and years, you wonder if they're not gonna become robots or, or just you know people without feelings because they are going through certain things that not normal people go through. Normal people don't go through that. Every day you go to work, you're seeing five to 20, you know, very sick people who are suffering and you're hoping to help them. And sometimes you lose one or two. And, and sometimes we're not thinking about that. And those are the type of relationships I would like to inspire people to have is to, to understand that we are, we are all going through these experiences. That's why I create art because art is something that's just, it's not words, it's just feelings, you know? It brings feelings out in people. People relate to these tears that I have on these paintings and these other things of drowning is because they, they're going through the same thing I went through. And that's what I feel like, you know, they, they, they attach themselves to. The best art puts you in a feeling and probably you're sharing a feeling with other people who are seeing, seeing that or if it's music, you know, you hear a song and it's like, it can make you happy or it can make you sad or, you know, you, you get that same feeling that other people are sharing with you and that the artist was trying to share with you. You mentioned that you started art to be able to communicate with your mom. How did it progress from there? Was it all about communication or was it an outlet for frustrations or? Just um, something I just continued to do. It's just that it became a way to cope or a way to remember the process and everything about art just felt right to me. Going to high school and being able to take art classes and being able to be really good at it was something I took pride in. So it's just to be able to come into a class and you're having still lives or you're having somebody pose and you'd be able to draw it. It was something I took pride in. That's until I, you know, I lost my vision with sickle cell and I'm like, you know, I have to figure out other ways to create my art, you know? So now I'm more experimental with my work because I'm not really able to see what I want to draw anymore the way I used to. So, you know, now I'm more experimental, but um, before it was something I just really loved, you know, loved doing and an escape really. Was there a moment when you went from I, I like to paint, I'm a, you know, I like to do art. To, I'm an artist. This is, you know, my calling. That's what I'm going to do with my life. It really never came to that. There's this thing where I looked at the art world and I was like, um, you know what? After I created the Sickle Cell series and they took off, people who I grew up around, you know, they started to talk to me about what art is. They were interested in art. They became artists for themselves. They get they moved to New York saying, you know, this is the place you make it at. And they started selling art for for the money or for the, you know, as a to make a living at, at it. For me, it never came to that. For me, it was like if I wasn't sick, if I didn't have sickle cell, I probably would be doing something else with my life because I love science. I love a lot of other things. I love languages. Probably would be traveling the world or, or learning some other language or, or or living somewhere else completely. But for me, with sickle cell, communicating what the pain is and going through the issues I went through, it just became something that could get me out of the situations I'm in. My art got me out of 
the streets when I was homeless. Like I used my portfolio to get into a building that was speci- specially made for artists. That's where I'm now, you know? Every time I, I, I've got into trouble, my art opened the door for me to get out of the issue that I'm having. So it was always a tool that I used to continue to cope with life. It never was a thing that helped me like um, make a living at. It was never that. So I, it's still never really that to me. But to me, the most important part of it is knowing that if someone sees my work and they have this disease or they having gone through something similar, if it inspires them to 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 think about life or think about what they've gone through and continue to fight it, then I'm glad, you know, that I was able to create that. You know, one thing that I think you underestimate hurts is uh, the way the way you speak about sickle cell disease. I remember the first time I heard you speak was uh, at that priapism um, town hall with Bury, with uh, Dr. Bury and Dr. Drew uh, in Fort Lauderdale. I don't know if you remember that. Honestly, the way you speak about sickle cell disease is art in itself. It's um, it is uh, really refreshing. But but I have a question for you. You know you you inspire a lot of us. But but let me ask you this: what what inspires you? Mostly, even when we go through all these tough times, I get inspired by science and innovation. Like I spend a lot of hours looking at um, what SpaceX is building down in Boca Chica. I have videos over videos. I watch all these videos. You watched the launch the other day? Yeah, I saw the launch. I was watching the whole thing. You know, I didn't even sleep. I just stayed up watching all that. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm inspired by pioneers, people who break barriers, people who build new stuff, people who speak new languages. You know, everything is a language to me. It's like, you know, looking at doing something new and something that has nothing, nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with health, nothing to do with all that kind of stuff. It's just something different. You know, I like looking at those type of things. Those things inspire me to continue. Like, you know, if you're having a bad day, like I'm having a bad day or I'm, I'm, I'm feeling bad and I've had some tough times this year and it's like, you just want to be inspired to continue, you know, to keep, keep pushing and, and keep going. So I just want to see the next launch. I want to see this thing be successful. I just want to see this, this other thing, you know. And sometimes I just watch videos about Japan because I want to get there someday. I want to go. And I want to, you know, walk around and, and just look at this this place, you know. So those type of things inspire me to move on. It's not like it's not about the people, but it's about what they do, you know. Wow. Do you paint that stuff? No, I never really paint about uh, space or, well, Japanese culture. I do paint a little bit. Space is just something I like to watch, and I, I, I'm very fascinated by. It. If, if if things were normal, you know. I definitely was going to go, go into some kind of sciences, you know. I didn't know which science I wanted because I kind of loved all, all types of science. But I was going to definitely go into something. I see that in the art sometimes there's chemical structures or floating molecules. Yeah, because it, it always brings my curiosity uh, up to the surface. Like um, the chemical structure of a drug that's been th- that I'm taking now. You know, I'm taking Oxbrida and it's, it's a new drug, you know, but I don't know the language or the chemicals or, or have the education, but I know somebody had gone through that path and they figured it out. So those, are, to me, those are puzzles and those are puzzles being solved by human beings. And I feel like I'm a black man and I, I'm growing up in, in, in a community who, who had very very disheartened or, or, or set back in a way that they feel like negatively towards education. Like you a nerd, uh, you this, this thing. So I was always a nerd to my friends, you know. I wasn't hip, I wasn't all that because I was, I was this guy who was getting straight A's in my science class, you know. If I wasn't sick, I was an honor roll student all the time. So it was always something that I took, you know, a little negative because I felt like these guys were looking at me like, you know, I'm better than them, but I, I didn't feel that way. I just felt like I'm hungry for education. I'm hungry for that language. These people are speaking a language you don't know. Learn it. 
so you can do something for your community. I wanted to, I have these dreams, like there's a doctor in Nigeria who's going to cure sickle cell. He's going to be the one, you know, but what I find in my folks are, you know, they're very spiritual. They believe in, 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 in other things. They, they, they want to heal in the natural ways. And, but I love science, that other language. That other language is solving a lot of things. And I want, I want us to have the keys to these, these languages, the, the, these solutions. Cheat Codes is brought to you today by Global Blood Therapeutics. GBT is a biopharmaceutical company committed to discovering, developing, and delivering life-changing treatments that provide hope to underserved patient communities, including sickle cell disease. GBT is grounded by a mission-driven culture and built with a team of experienced and passionate people committed to making a difference in the communities it serves. Cheat Codes is grateful to GBT for supporting today's episode and for serving the sickle cell community. Let me ask you a profound question. You know, there's a lot of us who are um, really dedicated to the cause and and really want to, we really want to make things better. I'm talking about doctors. What are we doing wrong? What I I always feel like we're not, we're not meeting the patients where the patients are. Like, I just feel like we, it feels like we live in, you know, we, we have this common goal but I just feel like we are stuck in this patient versus doctor relationship. I want to move towards patient and doctor. This is, this is where I'm getting at. It's the language, right? The education and the language creates a barrier. To understand a doctor, to understand what they had to go through to become one is going to make the language easier. You're thinking in a way that I'm not thinking. Say, I never got inspired to like science and class or never got inspired to like any kind of medical thing. All I want to do is I know I'm sick. I just want to come in, get my pills, go back and go do normal things. I don't want to think about sickle cell. I don't want to advocate for sickle cell. I don't want to hear any of that. I just want a normal life. That's where that mind is, right? But if, you, if you're thinking about education, you're thinking about different languages, you're trying to bridge a gap. See, you're trying to bridge a gap, but the, the, the person who is sick also needs to do a lot of work to try to bridge the gap, to meet halfway, you know? So for me, I, I, I take it up on myself where I feel like I have a lot to carry, a lot of responsibility to carry. I feel like we have to look at ourselves and we have to look at ourselves as a community and take on some of the responsibility because all of it is on us. We don't want these doctors to feel responsible to take care of us well. That's what I'm saying about you know being inspired. Why are not the people who come at me, who's going to treat me, why do they not, why do they not look like me? Why do they not come from my community? because they, they would understand my troubles easier. If they came from the same block I came from and they went to medical school and they got back to this community and they giving back, we wouldn't have this us versus them mentality all the time because people are making a big deal out of an illusion, you know? It is the disparity between access to education, access to a lot of things, the, the, the racial divide, everything that has to do with what people of color has to go through, it creates a lot of distrust. It creates this whole valley of destruction in its wake. So people who, who have sickle cell, if we are, are mostly from this community, we are going to be part of this divide. And it's a sad thing to think about because I get sad about it. It's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to fix. When you distrust someone, and if you really start having really hate in your heart because you see a cop shot a person that looks like you, and that's all over the news, and then you're going to go in for your pills, you go to the pharmacy, they turn you back because they don't trust you 
you know, they don't feel like you really need these pills, you know, everything makes a mess. For you to want to fix that, it's a very, very difficult thing. It's more about us as a community healing from everything that we are dealing with to be able to get beyond that because we have to meet you guys halfway too. We have to understand, you know, that you guys may not have read about sickle cell, but now we try, we're trying harder to get that information to doctors to have that education. So it's not an excuse anymore because we've been fighting for that for a long time. So we want these, the, the patients, the community they come from to also learn the language of what's the, not only the language, but what is the process to get to, to become a nurse, to become a person who's at that job doing that work because they need to kind of understand too, because compassion and empathy goes both ways. That's how I feel about it. You know, we can't always ask for empathy coming from the doctor or the nurse. It has to be both ways or it won't work at all. I can put blame on you guys all the, all the time because I, I've seen what you guys done to me, but I don't carry that. You know, when I see Dr. Z doing all this work, I'm like, wow, man, this man is like, He's a hero to me. Everybody who has touched my life in a positive way. One of my best friends is Randy. That's my nurse. He's the guy who did my phoresis for about eight years now, 10 years until I stopped recently. These people are my heroes. These people saved my life. These people touched my life in a positive way. We have to carry that in our hearts. As people who have a disease, we have to carry those people who helped us in our hearts. Because it's so easy when somebody does you th does a, a dirty thing to you or, or a negative thing. Hate is so easy. Holding on that anger and frustration is so easy. Learning to love someone and caring and caring that person and saying this person really helped me when I really needed it. That's not, that's we take that for granted. You know, normally we take that for granted. We carry that hate more and it's more motivational to have people hate. That's why Trump won, <laughs> you know? Those people, those people, you know? Hate is easy. You can move the, the world with hate, but love is harder, you know? People are shy, shy away from that. I don't have any answers, you know? I just, philosophy, that's, that's just, <laughs> it's just deep stuff. <laughs> No, man, that's why we wanted you on, because like I said, this is what people need to hear. I mean, doctors need to hear this. Other warriors need to hear this. I mean, warriors know about you. Warriors hear from you. You talk to them. You interface with them. You're connected as a community. But I just, I wish I could have every doctor in the world have a 30-minute session with Hertz and Azair to talk about sickle cell disease, and they would learn more from you than they would from the textbook. It's every human being's responsibility to speak on an issue and try to feel the issue. It's, it, it's not something that I want to do. There's so many other things I would love to do, you know, right now at the moment. But I, I like I just told a friend of mine, just speaking to her and knowing that she just got her son cured by donating her own bone marrow to her son. And now her son has the trait and everything went well. I'm like, that's, 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 that's a progress, you know? But there's so much fear into those things that you go through as a parent. So talking to her and knowing that she just went through this and I'm feeling like, you know, man, I'm feeling so negative and gloomy today because the sun is not out and all that kind of stuff. But I said, you know, I got I to gotta do this podcast. And I'm like, that's important because every time you interact with a community in any way, it's always helpful, you know, to, to, to be one person out there. The only thing that I, I don't like about advocacy is everybody sometimes think that they take the anger that they felt inside or the frustration that they felt inside, and they think that they are qualified to talk for the whole community. And I'm not qualified to talk for the whole community. I want to say that loud and clear. I'm not. I'm only qualified to speak on my experience and my experience alone. My art doesn't speak for the whole community. It only speaks for my experience alone. It's only when people agree with my experience or they feel inspired by my, my experience, that's when my voice speaks. 
that's when my voice matters is when people can find something they can agree on. I have trouble with the folks that feel like they know it all and they have all the solutions in the world and they just make things harder for the rest of us. So I don't advocate people to, to be like me or think that they, they, they can make a difference because I, I always take a step back and say, no, you can speak until you're hoarse in the throat, you, you, until you lose your voice. It, nothing might change. I don't put myself too high because I feel like things I fought for really hard 20 years ago, they're still happening. Wow. So, you know, Hertz, we, we t- Dr. Dr. Mike asked you about the moment when you felt like you were maybe becoming an artist as opposed to someone who just enjoyed art. I have the same question for you, but about sickle cell disease. When, when did it become real for you? Do you remember when you recognized, wow, this is real. This is something that I'm going to, this is going to be a problem for me. What, when, when did that, how young were you when you recognized that? It started really early on. My main thing when I was in Haiti was knowing that I only had one job, go to school and learn. And Haiti was kind of strict with the, with the way they learn. I, I didn't want to be, be punished in, in any way. It was, you know, punishment. You know, I hated that kind of stuff. I'm like, you want a child to learn. You shouldn't be trying to punish them or beat them up or anything like that to, to get them to learn something. So I always push myself with the memorizing of timetables and all that kind of stuff and make sure that my grades were always high. But there was a competition set in there. So if there was 26 kids, you were ranked from one to 26. And when you took your report card back home, it would have that rank on it. You know, not just your grades, it would have your rank, how you did on the test, how you did in class. So if you were number 26, People wouldn't, people at back home wouldn't be happy with you. So I was always ranked number one. When I got sick, I plummeted down to 15. And that's when I started realizing sickle cell is going to impact my life in a significant way. No matter how much my brain can work, no matter how much you know I can solve with my own mind, my body is going to cause me trouble. That's always that's that's when I started learning that, and I was like six, seven years old when I when I first learned that. Yeah, this is gonna be an issue. The same way that that school judge judges me is the same way my employers. The same way that if I got sick for two weeks, they start cutting my hours until they I had to quit because I can't make any you know any headway. So all of that told me I was prepared for that very early. Wow. Along the way, Hertz, as far as dealing with your sickle cell disease, besides your art, what have you felt like was important for you in dealing with sickle cell disease? Was there anything else you could lean on? Were there other things that made it better? Not really, because what most folks probably don't understand is that when we're dealing with sickle cell, okay, this is one person dealing with sickle cell. So that depends on your background. What is, what is my background? Who are my parents? Are they middle class? Are they living in a nice neighborhood? Or are they living in, in, in a housing area or you know, with poverty all around? I've been through, through all of it. I grew up in a third world country. Then I moved to the United States. I've seen a lot of riches. And my stepfather who married my mom was a clear wall executive. Clearwell is like this shampoo kind of company. He was an executive. So he, you know, Haitian, but he was wearing a suit all the time, had a BMW. So we were fairly, we moved on to, he owned houses. So we moved to a a neighborhood where I went to a school. I was one of three, three black kids in in the whole school. Everybody else was white. And my best friend, his father had a, uh, one of those fancy Lamborghini cars, you know? So it was like a, a very high high class neighborhood. Then my mom died. I moved to Stanford, lived with my godmother and I'm living in housing and there's drug dealers next door, you know, having to fight bullies all the, every other day. So whole different life. So when you think about sickle cell, people need to realize the person and their background and what they have to deal with every day matters. Like if they have a stable home and they have people 
who are always having their back, people who care about them deeply and want them to do better, want them to succeed, or if they're dealing with the natural consequences of living in an in a area that's not you know, suitable for human life, you know, that they have to fight every day just to get by. They're not only fighting sickle cell, they have to walk down these streets and survive. And this is what our community has to come to terms with. And this is what the doctors need to understand. When we walk in, we, you, you need to know our background to understand why we're giving you attitude or why we're acting in such a way. Because sometimes if you don't have this mean stare, this tough guy look, and you're smiling, you're gonna get your ass kicked walking down to some streets. It's just real like that for some areas that you live in. You know, you have to learn how to use the language. You have to learn how to change your language into something else. Like I'm speaking to you, I'm not using any of those words that I, I would have to use if I'm walking down that street, knowing the lingo and knowing, understanding how not to get yourself into a situation that's deadly for you, how to survive. And this is America. <laughs> that's all it is. It's the truth about America. It's the truth about what it is. There's so many parts of life that you can learn from, but the only thing that matters is for people to understand outside of sickle cell, you're just another human being trying to survive. It's either you have a background that's upper middle class or in poverty or in a third world country with no access to anything. Hertz, if you could talk to the six, seven year old version of you now, after having lived through the last you know, four or so decades, what, what would you tell that version of yourself? I don't know if I would have I wanted to influence him in any kind of way. Would you, would you warn him? Would you inspire him? Would you be hopeful? One of those things about the paradox of time travel or all these sci-fi <laughs> things is that- you are, You're I've a science about, person. You just told right, me. Right. I, I, I thought about it. I've thought about all these things. And one of the things that I, 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 I really buy into sometimes is the many worlds theory. Like when you make a decision, you split off and that creates another universe where that decision is different. I think this is just the, my path. It's just one path, one possibility that happened. So if I, I went back and I told myself something, my life could completely be different, you know, completely be different. You know, I fantasize about, man, I should have stayed in Haiti. <laughs> it would have been so good because the food is better. <laughs> But the thing is, when I got sick in Haiti, there's no aspirin. The kids are dying very early on, and they're not making it. I'm talking about right now. You go back and visit? I haven't gone back since 1986 when I first met my father, my bio biological father. I had to go back to meet him because um, my stepfather, he didn't want to be bothered you know, with me because he, he didn't feel like you know, it was a whole, whole bad issue there. So I had, my mom sent me back to meet my actual father and I met him, you know. So I went back for that, but that was December 1986, you know. So I've never gone back, but I've, I've always kept in touch with Haiti. I've always kept um, my Haitian cradle in check. I had one of the first Haitian websites on the internet. That, that's something I'm proud of because I was the first, you know, like one of the first, like at the same moment, the same month, this other guy from Miami launched his website. That was the same time I launched my website. My website was Creole.com. It was about learning Creole and keeping Creole in check. So I had, I had, I had to keep my language, you know, I had to keep my language and not forget it. But I've never gone back because I felt like going back would break my heart because I would never want to come back to the United States. I would just stay, even though it would be like a death sentence for me to, to go to Haiti right now because I would not be able to survive. But I feel like I, I wouldn't want to leave. Wow. What is the concept of sickle cell disease in Haiti? I, I, I wonder about what the stigma, is there stigma associated with sickle cell disease in the Haitian community? I think there's stigma with everything that kind of kind of the disease that you could have. I'm not like a expert. I can tell you some of the stories in my experience. My experience growing up 
is is like this. Now, this is 1973, so you have to like 70s, 80s. So in Haiti early on, when they learned that I had sickle cell, they learned at six months old. There were actual doctors from the United States that were there that were testing for sickle cell at that time. So I knew even in Haiti at six months old that I had sickle cell. But the belief around the family, the, the extended family, the friends, the everything, voodoo, you are cursed. They, they had this supernatural explanation for it. It wasn't about science. You just took me to the hospital. Doctors tested my blood. You found out there's a name for it, alimi falciform in Haitian Creole or in French. You know a name for it, but there was still this stigma of you are cursed. It was a voodoo thing. It's your mom, it's your dad or your grandfather. And it carried a lot of weight because you're going through a lot of pain and, and people are thinking, your family did something wrong to somebody and this is revenge. That probably sticks with you, man, as a kid, hearing that kind of stuff, that probably sticks with you. It does. And later on, I had this, um, this really nice Haitian girl I met in, in the library and she was sitting next to me and, and she was surfing the internet and I was surfing my website and I said, I like showed her my website because she looked Haitian to me. I'm like, Did that work? Yeah, it worked for a little while. So she, she was like, you know, emailing me for like seven years, but she was very religious. So she didn't want to mess with me. But after a while, you know, seven years later, we started dating. It became a thing where her uncle is in Haiti and he was seeing a lot of children with sickle cell dying. So he told his sister, her mother, that this man has no future. He's going to die on her. You shouldn't allow her to marry this man. And it became a really, really bad situation where she was, she had to choose between me and her family. And I'm like, no, you shouldn't be, you know, choosing. It just made a, a, a mess, you know. So it, it, it created a, a real bad experience where it's heartbreak type things, you know, where you feel like you are rejected because of what you have. And people don't understand that. Uh, I survived all this time. You know, I can I can die by walking down the street. You know, there's so many other deaths I could face. Sickle cell is not the only thing I face. You know, when I turned um, when I turned 16, uh, I had my first car. It was like this Honda CRX, and you know, but it was it wasn't drug money. It was money from my you know my mom dying. It was money that I had you know, and it wasn't, you know, but I had to have a car. So I was happy to have a car, but driving in my neighborhood, shiny car, just washed it, you know, it's an old, older model, but it was, it, it was nice. I, I liked the little speed in it. <laughs> so I was yeah. cruising up, up Connecticut Avenue in Stanford and I got, got surrounded by police, police vehicles and their guns were drawn. And, and no way. Yeah, I mean, it was like that. And I'm like, I'm seeing this stuff now. I'm like, that's not new, <laughs> you know? That's not new at all. And it's just that there's so many ways to die. So I felt like it's not fair for people to just point out sickle cell and say, you don't give this person a chance. You don't love this person. Relationships have been really, really difficult, you know, to get into because of that situation. That's what Haiti and sickle cell means to me because that's the kind of experience that I have. Because of the kids dying, people have that mentality where your life has no future. And that's sad for a person to think that. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a suitable husband for their family member. Oh, man. Hurts. You are, um, you are just... I am a uh... depressing person. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, dude. I talk about sad things, man. <laughs> no, man. No, no. You are, you're real. You're real. And uh, you're authentic, right? And it's not easy to get that. It's not easy to get that type of authenticity. I think there's just a lot of stories, you know. I've, I've gone through a lot because I've seeked a lot of paths. You know, I've seek knowledge from a lot of different things. When when people, you know, push me on religion or anything like that, I throw myself into it. You know, I've been places I've traveled and I tried 
new experiences. You know, sometimes you your heart breaks because you tried something new, it didn't work out. Knowing that you are open to new experiences is something that helps you communicate. Because I think one of the things that would help my community more is if they would travel more, go outside of the United States, go somewhere. I think the first time I set foot in India, it changed my life completely. Because before I was so upset that I'm on food stamps and I'm living in poverty and I'm, I'm living. Then I went to India and I saw the real deal. I'm like, wait, why does this look like Haiti? This is, this is perfect. This is great. I'm like, this is Haiti to me. I'm like looking at it and I'm like, wow, the dirt streets. And I'm like, then there's different parts. There's different parts with buildings and everything like that. But you saw real life, man. It, it's it, it's right in your face. And I think we take this stuff for granted in the United States where we don't understand how good we have it. We don't understand this, this stuff. I think a lot of people who hear about countries in Africa, like Ghana, Nigeria, and the sickle cell communities there, they don't understand how long it would take for a pill like I'm having now, Axe to get to a place in Nigeria, to get to a place, you know, in Ghana, to, to, to get to these little communities. And sickle cell is vastly, it's a vastly more populated, like they have millions of warriors, you know, and millions more of people with the trait. And that's a big, huge problem. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true, man. We sometimes neglect the warriors that... Uh that are unfortunately born in the wrong place. Yeah, this is the thing that I think people need to learn too, is that you don't choose where you are born. You don't choose who you are born. That's why I, I find it so difficult to hate easily, like to, to set myself against another group of people. I'm like, hey, I could have been born in Iraq. Why do I need to go there and bomb people? I could have been born over there and I could have seen everybody else as terrorists. Those people who we see as evildoers, they see us as the enemy because we are bombing them. Can you imagine not having a choice of where you are born and you are born there? What, what you're gonna look at, at Americans as? I'm gonna look at you as the most wicked place because you took away my mom or my dad. And we, we don't think about the other side. And that, that's one of those bridging the gaps type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Perspective, right? It's all about perspective. Try to see yourself in that other person's life. You know, one thing that you said to me that always sticks with me. Uh, first of all, I, I got to say, man, I don't think you recognize how much of an impact you've had on me. But uh, one of the things that you said to me that, that uh, I hang on to is you said it's important to hold on to hope. We had a conversation about the word hope. And um, I guess as we finish up this conversation, what are you holding on to right now? What what is what is it that you are? What is powering you? And and what are you looking forward to? And and what what is it? What is it that's bringing you hope in the moment about sickle cell disease? If you asked me this a couple months ago, I probably would think uh, I'm gonna die tomorrow. You know, because I was going through some stuff with um, I had this blood clot. It was causing me to pass out to have some real serious issues. I didn't really think I was going to make it through certain things because I couldn't even walk two steps, you know, and get somewhere. So I felt really down on myself for a while. And it's just difficult to know what life is sometimes. But then I realized I can fight through most of these things. I've been there before and I can continue to fight through it. Knowing that it's winter time and the weather was 70 de degrees and it was down to 40 then it was 70 and i'm looking at my facebook and i'm seeing stream and stream uh, a new stream of warriors who are fighting for their lives in the hospital and i'm on this new medication and it's not causing me that issue i'm not feeling the aches when the temperature drops or raises you know i'm not feeling those type of things so i'm feeling like there are things out there that can make your life better if you can only hold on and, and seek for those things. And that's what hope is to me, is that even though you, you may think everybody's against you or this thing is going to take you out, there are still ways you can 
win. There are still opportunities to win. And there are still people out here who are fighting every day just to make sure that you have those opportunities. So I, I just feel like, you know, if we can only become one of those people for somebody else, it's worth it to fight on another day. That is amazing. Uh, once again, thank you for your time today, Hertz. Thank you for yeah, your inspiration. I appreciate it. I, uh, I appreciate your presence in my life, and I am, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to call you a friend. So, so thank you for, for all you do. It really was great to have you on the episode, Hertz. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hertz, stay healthy, my friend. Stay safe. Stay in touch. All right, brother. Thanks again to our episode sponsor, Global Blood Therapeutics. Visit GBT.com to learn more about GBT's commitment to advancing the treatment and care of people affected by sickle cell disease. Wow. Dr. Mike, that, um, you know, every time I talk to Hertz, it's just, um, it, it just powers me, man. It, it inspires me at the deepest level, right to my core. Such an amazing guy. I mean, uh, he's lived through so much stuff and uh, makes this beautiful art and then has this spirit, you know, he's uh, thinking about other people and how people can relate to each other and, you know, love instead of hate and hope. And, uh, you know, it's such a refreshing perspective coming from, from such a challenging place. I think we all have so much to learn from people like this um, who can turn those sort of negative feelings into positivity somehow, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing skill. And the way he speaks on sickle cell disease is just, I mean, he talks about being centered and, um, but this, just the authenticity with which he brings the message around sickle cell disease is just, I've never heard anything like that. And, you know, I think that's something we can all relate to. You know, certainly I have days where I'm coming from a point of frustration and I need to center myself and, and walk into a room. And, uh, you know, for Hertz to be able to look at what he's going through and see that, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing to me because it's, you know, you're going through pain for no good reason and you realize it's affecting your mood and that you should uh, center yourself before you go have a bad interaction with somebody and, and create a lasting impression. I, I think, you know, that it's such a, an incredible perspective that makes me think, you know, whatever little frustration I'm dealing with, I should be able to, to do to do that yeah absolutely absolutely i'm lucky that uh i mean i feel like we are lucky to um share his presence and 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 i feel a little bit wiser after talking to him for sure all right warriors well i know that a lot of you already don't hurt and um providers who may be listening uh, i guess recognize that uh that that sickle cell patient that walks into your er could be hurt um it's somebody who uh, is trying to center themselves and is is going through a lot that you you may not see you won't you won't see in his blood work and you may not see in his vital signs but um, sickle cell patients go through a, a, a lot beyond just the biology of sickle cell disease so bring kindness to your encounters and um, try to center yourself before you go and see a sickle cell patient in uh, in the room. Well, if you guys enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast. Follow me at Dr. Z Sickle Cell on Twitter and Instagram. And follow Dr. C at Himagineer. Follow Hertz. His uh, art is available on some products. And I learn stuff from him all the time on uh, Facebook. So, And he's got a, I mean, he's got an Amazon store and he's got, I think, an Etsy. And he's got some stuff on Facebook. Be sure to check him out. Uh, give him a follow. We'll add some of those links to the show notes and um, we will catch you guys on uh, the next episode of Cheat Codes of Sickle Cell Podcast. Uh, keep crushing it. Live well with sickle cell. Stay safe. Keep your masks on and uh, we'll see you in a few. See you soon. Peace. <laughs>